and looking sad. And this is when Andy has an idea. He calls the whole family in. He says to his wife, Effie, did you know that he was doing this? Looks at the boy, Billy. Billy, did you know your dad was doing this? He says, well, then, I can't let people who are aiding and abetting go unpunished. And he got the whole family into the cell so that they could throw a feast and enjoy life together. And this did not make crotchety old Ben Weaver very happy. Maybe you remember. Ben Weaver looks up through the bars of the outside of the cell looking in and listens. Listens as Ellie and Andy sing away in a manger. And something begins to happen to Ben Weaver. I don't like this works salvation approach or these people who are all about religiosity or these folks who think that somehow their good deeds are going to get them into heaven. What they're talking about, what they're saying they're upset about, is a misunderstanding among some about where the gospel starts. We can all fall into this trap. Remember, uh, whenever you find a safe road, there are ditches on both sides. Okay, So one ditch, call it legalism, call it whatever you want, it's a misunderstanding about where the gospel starts. And it's the idea that somehow I know that I'm going to be right with God and I have a home in heaven with God because I've done everything right and I've done it the right way. I don't find that language in the New Testament very much. In fact, the Apostle Paul, who was so proud of how he's lived that he actually told whole churches, follow me as I follow Christ, himself says in the book of Philippians that I know that in that final day, I'm going to stand before heaven and it will not be because of what I've done. Instead, I'll have a righteousness that is not my own but one that is found through faith in Christ. So if you find this language over and over again in the New Testament, him, and that we need to believe, you know how he begins it? For God so loved the world that he did the giving so that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Put the emphasis where it belongs. The gospel starts with God. We know this from the Old Testament. Remember the book of Exodus? God has a people and he expects his people to keep the law. You know that. They don't keep the law, they get in big trouble. That's clear. Question. Were they his people? Did he call them his people? Did he treat them as if they were his people? Did, they, did he rescue them as his people before he gave them the law? What's the answer? Yes. The exodus came before Sinai. The rescuing started with God not with your ability to keep the law. That was always the story. So where does the gospel start? It starts with God. If you fall in this trap, on this side, it can be fear, it can be pride, it can be arrogance, it can be ignorance, it can be a lot of things. But the trap over here is, I know that I'm right with God because I've saved myself by my own bootstraps. We don't use that language, but we might think that. And if that's where we are, listen to Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 7, where he makes it very clear not to fall into that trap. We ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. But when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. He saved us, not because lavishly, therefore being justified. Do you see that language? By his grace, we became heirs. Let's avoid ditch number one. The gospel is a story about God. It begins with God and it ends with God but there's a ditch on the other side. The ditch on the other side, if this is, can be called um, legalism or self-promotionalism, this side would be licentiousness. Living any way you want. Acting as if there is no such thing as a code by which I ought to live my life. This is the other ditch. And this is a ditch in which what we forget is what the gospel points to. 
If this ditch forgets where the gospel starts, this one forgets where it leads. The gospel was always intended to create something new, something different. You don't tell somebody who's been an addict, who's now gone through the process and is no longer an addict. You don't tell them you're a brand new person. And don't mean by that, that's going to lead to new habits, new activities, new ways of thinking, new ways of living. It's not going to look like the old person. New implies getting rid of the old. Titus tells us to avoid that ditch. Look in Titus 2, verse 11. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, and some versions, teaching us, ESV, training us to say no, to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions, and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. I want you to see the two ditches are discussed in the book of Titus. The gospel is not about you, it's about God, so quit focusing on what you've done, focus on what He's done. But on the other hand, what do you have to show for the fact that you are a changed person? Where does the gospel start? Where does the gospel lead? He's dealing with these. And in Titus chapter 1, verse 1, Paul shows how the two go together. Look at the first verse. Paul, a servant of God and an apostle of Jesus Christ, for the sake of the faith of God's elect and their knowledge of the truth, which accords with godliness in hope of eternal life. Can I say that differently? I recognize we are the elect. That means chosen by God. I recognize that there needs to be knowledge of the truth, which is a phrase we've seen Paul use two or three other times. And in all those other times, he meant the gospel, which accords with godly living. Do you see how this works? God chose you to start with him. The gospel is the story you live, and it leads to a changed life. The gospel links starting with God and being different as a result. So let's just see how this all works together in the book. If you look at verses 5 all the way down to verse 9, he says, I left you in Crete because I need you to appoint some leaders in the church. And I want you to find people who understand this story. That is, they've accepted this message and now their lives show it. They're upright. They're self-controlled. They don't go in for the kinds of conversations that are all about themselves, but their life shows that they understand the implications of the gospel. Verse 10, because there are many who are insubordinate and empty talkers and deceivers, they must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families, teaching for shameful gain what they, want, what they ought not to teach. This sounds bad. False teaching, false doctrine, it's bad. In fact, look at verse 16. He calls them detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. That sounds bad. Which ditch are these teachers coming from? I don't know. It could be either one. Because it's funny how you can go really far left or really far right and end up meeting somewhere in the back. Because it's the same condition. It is about self rather than surrender. When your focus is on the self, you can find a reason to hang on to yourself on the far left or the far right, seeing both ditches. In chapter 2, verse 1, he says, As for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. Tell the older men to live lives that show the implications of the gospel. Tell the older women, tell the younger women, tell the ministers to live lives that show the implications of the gospel, not licentiousness. But now notice how he wants to explain the, the way to get out of this ditch. It's grounded in the reason to stay out of this ditch. Go back at verse 10. Show in all good faith so that in everything they may adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. What an interesting phrase. 
adorn the doctrine of God our Savior. When you adorn something, you dress it up. You package it. What does it mean to adorn the doctrine of God? It means how the gospel is going to be perceived. I'm sorry, how the doctrine of God is going to be perceived. And I believe the way you adorn the doctrine well is that you package it with the gospel. Look at the next verse. For the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, godly lives in the present age, waiting for our blessed hope, the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all lawlessness and to purify for himself a people for his own possession who are zealous for good works. I know that preachers can sometimes get on hobby horses. And it's the job of elders to kind of cut those legs out of those horses so the preachers would get you know, on a different hobby. I've been on a hobby horse all year long on Sunday nights, which is that the gospel can be one line or two lines or several lines. And I see in the book of Acts that it's seven points. The seven points you find in Ephesians 4, verses 4 through 6. I see that in the speeches of Acts, that when the gospel is presented... Somehow, when you're done hearing it, you believe there's one God, there's one Lord Jesus Christ, there's one story of faith, the death, burial, resurrection of Jesus, there's one body, there is one forgiveness, there is one hope, and there is one spirit. Did you notice all seven in these three verses? I want you to see it. There is one God, the grace of God has appeared. There is one Lord. Notice that he calls in verse 13, the great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. There is one story, which is about death and resurrection. Notice it says he came to redeem us. There is, in fact, one body. Do you see the next line here? To purify for himself a people for his own possession. There is forgiveness. Notice the phrase of redeeming and purifying. There is one spirit because it it says we've called you to live godly, rejecting worldly passions, to live self-controlled and upright. That's the fruit of the spirit. And then finally, there's one hope. Do you see in verse 13, we're waiting for our blessed hope. You know what I'm saying? I think he's doing here. I almost began by telling you that the word gospel doesn't appear in the book of Titus. Doesn't have to. Gospel is all over the book of Titus. And he uses different phrases to mean it. The truth in verse 1, the grace of God in chapter 2, the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior in chapter 3. But now watch this. You root the story in the gospel. Root the gospel in what God did, and you show how it leads to a changed life. It does something to you. It leads to a new motivation for how to seek good works. You remember, Paul puts it this way in Ephesians. You were saved by grace through faith, not of yourselves, not of works, lest anyone should boast. The very next verse. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works. So salvation is in Christ, by God, by grace, through faith, but what's it for? So that we'll be different people, zealous for good works. Look how he does that in this book. He says it right here in chapter 2, but you see it at the end of chapter 3. We already read verse chapter 3, verses 3 through 7. Would you look at verse 8, which follows on the heels of the story about avoid this ditch? It's all about God. It was all his work. Look at what he did. Look at verse 8. The saying is trustworthy, and I want you to insist on these things, that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. I think that when we're dealing with both ditches, the answer to how to avoid the ditches is the gospel. Sometimes that we're not content with that. 
we preachers try to find ways to bring people to faith, and we're not real creative. We tend to use the same two sticks that have been around for a long time, fear and pride, because they work. You know, you could really get people to give their lives to Jesus by making them feel really lousy. Maybe some of us can remember our baptism, that we got hit in the face with a brimstone, and we came forward and we turned around and we backed ourselves into the arms of God. I remember being in rooms where somebody told me that I really think I came to Jesus because I didn't want to go to hell. It is possible, it is possible for fear to drive us to Jesus. I don't think that that's a bad thing. I find fear used in the New Testament, but it's not a lasting thing. Fear is sometimes a helpful motivator, but it's not a glue. It won't keep you there. Well, there's another way to motivate people, and that's pride. We can talk about maybe all the great things you're going to get. Let me tell you about your mansion, robe, and crown. Let's just talk about how we're going to pile up stuff for ourselves, and then we can just sit back and just think about how great it is that our neighbor's going to burn and we're going to have lots of riches. That's not really a New Testament story either, but it can happen. They can focus on sort of pride of place, or we can talk about all of our accolades and keep a list of all the good things we've done and be able to tell ourselves at any moment, at least I'm so much better than my neighbor. But neither of those is a gospel motivation. There's a better motivator to bring us to Jesus than fear or pride. Listen to the language of how the gospel works and why I think it's so beautiful. And this brings us to Andy Griffith, believe it or not. If your focus is fear, what you'll think is do this and you'll get in, uh, if you do this bad thing, you'll get in trouble with God. If your focus is pride, don't do that. Outsiders do that. And then they'll look at you and they'll think you're pitiful. These are both self-centered motivations. And the self is what gets you in the ditch. What if the motivation isn't about the self? What if the motivation is about Christ? What if we really believed that the payoff was accomplished 2,000 years ago on the cross and that the cross now is our joyful and willing shape of my life? I don't know what you call that, but maybe we call it believing in God deeper and deeper or adorning the doctrine of God well. Listen to Titus 2, 11 through 14 again. The grace of God has appeared that offers salvation to all people. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly in this present age while we wait for our blessed hope. Can you think of reasons why we might want to say no to things of the world? Reasons you may tell your kids to say no to the things of the world? I can think of some. Maybe we should say no to the things of the world because I'll look bad if I do. Maybe I should say no to the things of the world because I'll be, I'll be kicked out of my Christian social club if I do that. Maybe I should say no to the things of the world because you know I might end up lost forever. Maybe I should say no to the things of the world because... God won't give me the health and wealth that I'm hoping he'll give me. In Titus, Paul doesn't appeal to any of those. What Paul appeals to is the difference Christ makes. And when that vision is set before you, it changes how you think. It changes how you see. It changes how you live. I I love this example I got from somebody else, but it really works really well. It's the language of heating up a spoon. You know, sometimes we can try to change people by bending them into conformity with the gospel. Uh, You can bend a spoon. You can bend a spoon. Or you can melt the spoon. And sometimes, using fear or pride, we will try to bend people into conformity with the gospel, and it may bring them to the baptistry, but it won't last long. But the gospel melts your heart into conformity with the gospel. 
crotchety old Ben Weaver. All the ways Andy's tried to think to get Ben to realize what's going on in this moment. Ben knows the law, he knows the rules, and he doesn't care who suffers because of it. But then he hears the song. He hears that beautiful song, and he wants in. So what does he do? He finds a way to get himself thrown into prison. I believe the line Andy uses is, if a fellow is trying to get himself thrown in the jug, which is a great way to say, he wants to get put in jail. Ben shows up. He does all the wrong things so he can get in, so he can get in to enjoy it, and he brings a suitcase. And in the suitcase are all these gifts for all these people that he just put in jail. The gospel melts your heart. And when we live that way, it will melt the heart of people around us. What does Paul say to husbands who are living with cantankerous wives? Tell your wives to shape up. Doesn't say that. You know what it says? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, not because she was holy. How does the gospel work for wives who are married to just the worst deadbeat husbands? Wives, win your husbands over without a word so that just by your godly life, they may see and proclaim Jesus as Lord. Watch how instead of trying to bend people into conformity with the gospel, just living the gospel melts hearts of stone. This is Paul's point. I want to see the world get out of the ditch of licentiousness. The answer isn't, believe it or not, more sermons about why licentiousness will get you in hell. The answer is more sermons that make you want to believe and obey the gospel. For the gospel melts hearts into the love of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. God, we love you. We praise your name. We want your word to speak to our lives. We want to be more like you. We ask you, Father, melt our hearts. Remind us of the story of love. Remind us that we are nothing and have nothing without you, but because of you, we are and have everything. But even that is only a testament to the glory of your holy and righteous name. Father, we know that we'll be with you forever. But Father, we know that's only because we're in Christ and may all glory and praise and honor be given to him. Father, help us to avoid the ditches. Help us, Father, to see ourselves the way you see us, not in our sin, but in our Savior, so that after we've done all that we're told to do, we may say we are unprofitable servants. We've only done that which is our duty to do. Father, may we defeat false doctrine and false living by adorning the doctrine of you with the beauty of the gospel. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on, y'all, Jesus, you're my firm foundation. I put my hope in your holy word. I put my hope in your holy word.